Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending October 19th. First up, this was a suggestion by a friend of mine, Tim McGraw, to do a report and talk a little bit about something called the Kessler Syndrome, also known as the Kessler Effect. Uh, back in 1978, a scientist called Donald Kessler had the uh, he ran some calculations and he came up with the theory that we could reach a certain point in the accumulation of space junk in outer space, both in low orbit and, and in high orbit, to where you could get some material colliding together, and when it was dense enough, it would actually have a cascading effect like a chain reaction where it would just, pieces would hit other pieces that would then hit other pieces and other pieces, in other words, and the problem about it is it could get to such an extent that it could render uh, space exploration pretty much unfeasible, not just for years, but maybe for decades or even for generations if it got too bad. And uh, it's an interesting article. I'll give you the link to the article. Wikipedia, I always find that one of the best sources myself. They uh, give citations. They've got uh, good explanations because it's your average people doing the explanations most of the time. One of the things they are really concerned about most of all is a satellite that's been in orbit for about 10 years and it just went offline in 2012 and that is the satellite Invisat. That's a European satellite that was launched and it's a Earth-focused satellite. It actually took pictures on the Earth for environmental studies and weather patterns, crop patterns, things like that. Well, this thing is the largest civilian satellite ever launched into outer space. It weighs about 18,000 pounds and it doesn't really give you a scale on the picture here. I'll put up a picture of it, but if you were standing next to it, it would probably be something like the size of a school bus. And so this 18,000 pound uh, non-functioning satellite is up there now and they estimate probably twice during a year space debris gets close to it within probably about 200 meters or so and eventually if it does take a large strike and goes into pieces both small and large chunks this could be the exact trigger to um, actually have the Kessler effect take place and uh, nobody knows actually for sure I haven't seen any buddy that's going to give any kind of accurate estimate, including Donald Kessler himself, as to if or when this is going to, he, he obviously believes it will, but uh, as to a date when this will actually take place, but um, that's what some people think could possibly be the trigger for it. If you uh, get a chance to read this, it's pretty interesting. They've uh, talked about um, two likely solutions called space broom, and it's two different ways of using lasers to heat up material. Um, one using a laser at a um, at one side of the debris to give it some kind of a orbital velocity or to change the orbital velocity and cause it to uh, fall back into the atmosphere. Um, neither one of them have been anything but just in preliminary tests. Nothing's actually been tested to do it. Uh, um, I don't know. It, it's something that maybe we need to look into. Maybe some type of a satellite itself to be a, a cleanup robot or something for, for outer space. But yeah, if it does actually take place and happen, that would be kind of bad, especially for a uh, uh, not just even if it eliminated the human exploration into outer space, the the real danger uh, besides that would be the fact that it would start start knocking out active satellites. I mean, we get everything from GPS and uh, navigational um, location information to uh, television to uh, communications. So if this starts cascading and knocking a big portion of the satellites that are functioning and uh, useful out of the sky too. Not going to be a good thing. Next up, this is about NASA's Hubble. I've got a, a more recent picture. This is an October 9th picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the cool thing about this is some people had said that they thought by this point in time when the comet uh, Ison got close enough to the sun, by this time it would start breaking up and uh, form more than one nucleus. Well. It looks like by this picture that it is still at least up until this point holding together in one piece. And uh, I guess November 28th it says is when it's going to be closest to the sun. So if it gets past November 28th, and then especially in the swing around when we'll be able to get a chance to see it, I think uh, December and January are supposedly going to be, if, if it does end up being bright enough, are going to be the days that we can see it and take a look at it. But this article is from astronomy.com, and so far it's still looking good that it isn't falling apart, and uh, you know maybe it'll survive the, the trip around the sun. And uh, 
This was sent in by 1954 Shadow. Thank you for the link here. Uh, this was giant chunk of Russian meteor recovered. Uh, some of you will remember, and I did talk about it in a TDD report, that back in February there was an explosion of a meteor over Siberia. Um, Russian scientists have pulled a half ton chunk of meteor out of a lake in Siberia, and uh, it's rather surprising. I was kind of thinking by the articles I was reading and the descriptions and stuff like that, I thought we were kind of talking about something maybe the, the size of a basketball or maybe at the most the size of a beach ball. Well, this thing's quite a bit bigger than that. This is quite a huge uh, chunk of rock, and I guess what they pulled out isn't even the, the total, th total uh, piece of uh, meteor or in this case meteorite since it has landed but check out these pictures here and uh, from the one picture I can see here too it does look like your classic meteorite because it's got those indentations it does they say uh, if you find a, a rock big enough and uh, it's a meteor that chances are it has these little indentations like almost looks like somebody took a, a hunk of clay and put their thumbprint in it well this rock sure looks a lot like that too and uh, they expected let's see the expected media, the suspected piece of media recovered this week weighs at least 1,257 pounds. However, it's a, only a fragment of the original, and they believe the original to be 54 foot across with 10,000 uh, metric tons weight. So that was surprising to me, just how big it was myself. And next up, this is an older article. This is going back uh, almost a year ago, but. I don't think I've ever reported on it, and I've kept up with uh, several uh, posts on this, but if you're not aware of it, the U.S., as far as oil production, we're going to actually, by the year 2020, we're going to pass up Saudi Arabia and actually be a, a net world oil exporter. We're going to actually produce more oil than we use ourselves. I don't know if this is going to be a positive or a negative thing, really. I mean, in a way, we'll become oil independent, and much of that due to the prices being high enough to make it worth starting up a lot of wells that we have in the United States and especially in Alaska. Um, but the one thing that concerns me is it will cause us to not focus on the fact that oil is still a limited resource and we need to get on with developments for other types of uh, ways to travel. Mostly electric, I think, is the most promising now. I mean, people say hydrogen might be our future, but I'm not really convinced yet. But uh, we need some option other than just um, oil and gasoline fuel for our future, at least in my opinion. But if you get a chance, check out this article. This is from CNN Money, and the title is U.S. to Become Biggest Oil Producer. And this one was, I cannot for the life of me remember who sent this one in. I am not sure. So if you were the one that sent me the link to this um, article about Subaru, uh, please let me know and I'll give you credits down in the description. But one of my correspondents that sends in material on a regular basis sent in about the company Subaru. Now, a lot of you probably um, talking about the history of the company Subaru going back even um, around the World War II era. And like a lot of Japanese com companies like that that uh, were into mechanics and uh, things like that, they started as an aircraft manufacturer. and but you, you may not know the fact that, and this was why the link was sent to me, that they were actually a scooter manufacturer. They, they manufactured the Fuji Rabbit scooter, which was pretty common in the 60s in the U.S. Um, it was something I wasn't even aware of, but I, evidently by what the article says, or what the video says here, there were quite a few of these uh, Fuji Rabbit scooters around, and they looked really cool. I guess it even um, started being imported into the United States even ahead of the Vespa. Uh, so if you get a chance, this is just a short three-minute video from Subaru Vintage Garage, and it's about the Fuji Rabbit scooter. So if you get a chance, uh, check this out. And if you do a search, too, there's a lot more information on this Rabbit scooter. But the way this guy puts this video about it, it's, it's really cool and it's very concise. Um, very interesting video, so check it out. And last up. This is from Business Insider. For those of you that have smartphones, Android phones, iPhones, this is a link to 11 best astronomy apps for amateur stargazers. Pretty much all of them are smartphone apps. They vary in price from like, oh, $5.99, $2.99. A few of them are free. And the biggest part of them are for tracking things in outer space, mostly uh, stars, constellations, planets, things like that. 
Um, I have actually seen them. A couple of my friends do have them on their phone, but if you never have and you're into astronomy or uh, tracking objects in outer space and you get a chance, check it out. I mean, they're very reasonable cost, and uh, it's kind of cool, too, because I've used one of the smartphones, too, and even during the daytime, if you actually hold it up because of the it using GPS and the compass that's built in and the different orientation gyroscopes, uh, in the middle of day, you can point it up in the sky, and you know what you would be looking at if you could through the sky, you know, through the brightness of the sky and the light, um, uh, dimming it out. If you could actually, it actually show you what's uh, what you would see, and even through the Earth too, you can even point it down towards the Earth, and you, you can get a view as if you were looking through the Earth of what constellations, and uh, depending on the app you buy, it could even give you uh, views of the satellites and uh, other different things in outer space. So if you get a chance from Business Insider, check that out, and. Uh, be sure and uh, support the people that do make the apps. That's very important. But there's, like I said, there's even one or two free in there if you want to check that out. So anyway, that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.